Modern sawmills chase yield. Medieval sawyers chased grain. That tiny shift is why their beams are still here, and yours aren't. Your fence posts turn soft right where they meet the ground. Your deck boards cup, split, and turn gray before you've finished paying for the renovation. Every few years, something built from treated lumber needs replacing. Most people shrug and blame the weather, or the quality of modern wood, or bad luck. But there is another explanation, quieter and more uncomfortable. The way trees are cut today practically invites them to fail. Medieval carpenters knew a different way. They didn't have chemical plants, autoclaves, or pressure-treating cylinders. They had axes, pit saws, and a relentless obsession with how grain runs through wood. That obsession turned their beams and boards into something very close to immortal. If you visit a medieval church, barn, or timber-framed house, and look closely at the beams, you see clues. The timbers are often slightly irregular, not milled into perfect rectangles. The grain lines run straight from one end to the other with almost no wandering. When those beams check, when they crack, they often crack in predictable, harmless ways. The edges stay sharp instead of feathering out in splinters. If you could cut a slice through one of those old posts, you'd see the growth rings arranged in consistent patterns, sometimes nearly vertical, sometimes radial, but rarely in the chaotic layouts common in cheap modern stock. That is not an accident. It is the fingerprint of a different approach to sawing. To understand what medieval carpenters did, you first have to rethink what a tree looks like. In the forest, a tree is not a cylinder of generic wood. It is a bundle of long, hollow fibers wrapped in concentric rings around a core. Those rings record seasons, early wood formed in spring, late wood in summer, each with different density and strength. They are not symmetrical. They may be compressed on the side where the tree leans or distorted by branches and wind. Inside, the heartwood, older, often darker, can be more durable and more stable, while the outer sapwood carries more sap, nutrition, and vulnerability to rot. When you cut that tree into boards, you are really deciding which parts of that ring structure each board will inherit. Modern mills take a log, push it through band saws and circular saws, and crank out as many boards as possible, as fast as possible. The goal is yield and uniform size. The saws cut across rings at whatever angle gives the most product, so you get boards where the grain dives through faces, rings come out as sweeping arcs, and fibers run diagonally toward the surface. To the eye, it looks fine. To moisture and fungi, it looks like a network of ramps, wicks, and stress risers. Medieval sawyers, by contrast, had no industrial reason to chase maximum board count. Each timber took enormous labor to fell, move, split, and saw. They had every incentive to squeeze maximum life out of each piece, even if it meant fewer boards. So they aimed for something very specific, boards and beams where the grain ran straight and the growth rings met the surface at controlled, intentional angles. In many cases, they didn't saw in the modern sense at all. They split. Riving is the original medieval sawing technique that hardly looks like sawing. Instead of pushing a sharp tooth through fibers, you drive a wedge and let the wood break along its own grain, take a fresh oak log, drive a steel or wooden wedge down its center, and it will split into halves along a plane defined by the internal fiber alignment. Split those halves again and again, following the natural cracks, and you end up with billets whose fibers run continuously from one end to the other. There is no grain run out, no fibers cut halfway, only to emerge on a face, no short little ends waiting to pop out as splinters. From a structural and durability standpoint, 
This is huge. A riven board or beam behaves more like a bundle of tightly laid cables than a mess of chopped strands. When it shrinks across the grain, it does so more evenly, with fewer local weak points. When it absorbs moisture, water has a harder time racing along severed fiber ends into the heart of the piece. When fungi try to invade, they find fewer damaged pathways and are forced to work across intact cell walls instead of through broken, exposed tissue. In bending, riven timber takes higher stress before cracking because there are no pre-made microcracks of cut fiber ends waiting to join up. Medieval carpenters didn't express this in terms of microstructure or fracture mechanics. They just noticed that riven timbers lasted. Axe handles, wagon spokes, barrels, and tool shafts made from split stock stubbornly refused to fail. Barn posts and braces hewn from riven billets stayed straighter and decayed more slowly. Once they saw the pattern, they turned it into a rule. For parts that mustn't break or rot early, follow the grain. If you have to saw, make the saw follow the path the tree already laid out. This rule extended into something that, to modern woodworkers, looks like a fetish for quarter-sawn stock. When you slice a log, you can do it in several basic orientations. In plain-sawn or flat-sawn boards, the most common today, the log is just sliced repeatedly, producing boards where the growth rings hit the face at low angles, often less than 45 degrees. That gives the pretty cathedral grain patterns people recognize, but it also creates boards that cup, twist, and move heavily as humidity changes. The flats across the arcs of the rings want to become arcs again. The board bends towards the bark side or heart side, depending on how it was cut. In quarter-sawn or rift-sawn boards, you're cutting more like slices from the spokes of a wheel. The growth rings meet the face at steeper angles, often closer to vertical. That changes everything. When the board swells and shrinks across the rings, it does so more symmetrically relative to the face. The result is less cupping, more stable width, and more predictable movement. In many species, including oak, vertical ring orientation also exposes denser late wood and ray structures on the surface, increasing wear resistance and reducing checking. Medieval sawyers didn't have glossy diagrams of flat sawn versus quarter sawn. They had their senses. They noticed that boards cut with rings nearly vertical checked less, stayed flatter, and held joinery better. In fine furniture and paneling, they prized such stock for carving and painting because it shrank and swelled less, preserving delicate work. In structural members, they oriented sections so that the main stress directions played nicely with the ring layout, minimizing distortion under load. Over generations, this turned into a set of cutting patterns that, if drawn out today, would look remarkably like modern best practices for quarter and rift sawing. Put riving and ring orientation together, and you get the heart of the sawing technique that made medieval wood behave like it was enchanted. First, select the right log. Straight, slow-grown, minimal knots, lots of durable heartwood. Fell it at the right time of year, when sap is low and moisture content is starting from a better baseline. Then split it along its length to create halves or quarters where the grain is already straight. From those big wedges, lay out beams and boards so that each piece either follows the grain perfectly or intercepts rings at stable angles. If a piece will be a beam carrying bending loads, orient it so the growth rings run in a way that equalizes expansion and aligns the strongest wood in the zones of highest stress. If it will be a panel or a post, arrange it so water has the least opportunity to wick along open grain into the core. At this stage, nothing magical has been applied. No tar, no oil, no wax. And yet, a large part of the future durability is already baked in. The wood is more coherent as a material. 
its internal pathways for moisture and decay are more controlled. Its likely cracking lines are more predictable and less catastrophic. The sawing technique has quietly transformed the log into a set of pieces that want to age gracefully instead of fighting themselves for the next hundred years. Modern science, when it has bothered to look, has confirmed much of this. Tests comparing riven and sawn oak show higher bending strength and lower variability in riven samples. Quarter-sawn stock shows markedly lower tangential shrinkage and more dimensional stability than flat-sawn. Beams with fewer cut fibers at the surface are less prone to erosion and micro-splintering, which in turn slows down the trapping of moisture and dirt where fungi and insects can thrive. But these findings live mostly in niche woodworking circles, conservation reports, and research papers, not in the standard recipes of the construction industry. Medieval builders didn't stop at cutting. The sawing technique was only the first stage of making wood practically immortal. It prepared the material for what came next, seasoning and surface treatment that leveraged the clean, coherent grain. When you season a riven, quarter-oriented beam, moisture leaves in smoother gradients. Stresses equalize without creating violent distortions. Checks that do form tend to follow radial lines and remain shallow because the internal fibers are in long, straight columns rather than jagged paths that cross the section unpredictably. This matters a great deal once you start applying oils, tars, or waxes. Penetrating treatments can work deeper and more evenly when they are not constantly running into cut fiber ends and little dead ends inside the wood. The same straightness of grain that gives mechanical strength also gives a better highway for preservatives to move along, creating a thicker, more continuous treated zone near the surface. Think of it like this. Modern, flat-sawn, short grain-riddled wood is like a piece of broken-up spaghetti you tried to glue together. There are gaps and overlaps and fragile joints all through the interior. Medieval riven and well-oriented timber is a bundle of intact strands. If you soak both in the same protective liquid, which one saturates more reliably? Which one has fewer internal voids where water can hide but treatment cannot reach? The answer explains why, when we pull medieval beams out of old buildings or shipwrecks, we sometimes find an astonishingly deep zone of intact, preserved wood under a thin, weathered skin. The story gets even more interesting when you look at how medieval carpenters used this technique selectively. They did not split every log to the maximum extent. That would have wasted trees and labor. Instead, they reserved the most carefully riven and oriented material for the most critical components, tie beams, braces, sills, doorposts, and highly stressed parts of roofs and floors. Less perfect stock might go into infill, secondary framing, or temporary structures. Within a single building, you can trace a hierarchy of material quality. The places most prone to rot, near ground, exposed to weather, in complex joints, often feature wood that was not only of a naturally durable species, but also cut and oriented with obvious care. It is here that the practically immortal part really shows. A sill beam at the base of a timber-framed wall is in a terrible spot. Splashes from rain, rising damp from foundations, trapped debris, and constant load. Yet in some buildings, those sills, made from the best oak and cut so the heart sits high and the grain runs straight, have outlived multiple roof coverings, brick infills, and plaster finishes. Their sacrificial outer surfaces have weathered, but the core stays solid. When restorers open up those joints centuries later, they find tenons still, fitting snugly in mortises and pegs still gripping sound wood. Why call this a sawing technique modern science ignored? Because for most of the industrial age, 
The metrics driving wood production have been speed and volume, not lifespan. The cost of replacing a deck or a set of cladding boards every 15 years has been externalized onto homeowners and future budgets, not counted in the cost of the wood itself. Mills are rewarded for turning every bit of log into something, even if that something is a short-lived board riddled with runout and unstable grain. The idea of deliberately sacrificing yield and speed to maximize the service life of each piece seems almost perverse in that context. Medieval sawyers, bound to the pace of human labor and the realities of forests that took generations to regrow, had the opposite incentive. A beam that failed early was not just a product recall, it was a threat to the community. Time spent riving and orienting was paid back in roofs that didn't collapse and frames that didn't twist themselves apart. They internalized the cost of failure and made a different trade. Fewer pieces per tree, more years per piece. If you're a curious, practical, analytical viewer, the most powerful part of this story is not nostalgia. It's the realization that pieces of this medieval technique are still available to you right now without needing to live in the 14th century. You can't turn a big box lumber yard into a medieval pit saw overnight, but you can. Seek out riven or at least straight-grained stock for highly stressed parts, handles, posts, sills, braces. When you mill your own logs, Favor splits and cuts that align with the grain instead of random planks from the whole cross-section. Choose quarter or rift-sawn boards for surfaces where movement and checking will kill the finish or let in water. Orient beams so that ring patterns and hardwood placement minimize cupping and water trapping. Accept slightly odd shapes and lower yields in exchange for pieces that will move less and absorb treatment more evenly. If you combine that with thoughtful seasoning and the natural finishes medieval builders later added, heated pine tar and oil blends, beeswax polishes, controlled charring where appropriate, you're essentially reassembling the old system, from tree to cut to cure to coat. The sawing technique is the hinge between raw log and preserved wood. Get it wrong and no amount of finish can fully rescue the piece. Get it right, and you've quietly built decades or centuries of extra life into the structure before the first brush stroke touches it. Modern science has tools to describe all this. Anisotropy, fracture propagation, diffusion pathways, sorption isotherms. Medieval sawyers had none of those words, but they had something better for their purposes time, and the will to learn from it. Every failed beam, every rotten post, every warped panel was data. Over centuries, that data added up to a simple, radical conclusion. You don't just protect wood by what you put on it. You protect it by how you slice the tree in the first place. That is the medieval sawing technique that made wood practically immortal. It did not break the laws of physics. It obeyed them more precisely than our mass production systems usually dare.